I, I organized this uh, uh, morning into, uh, into three parts. Uh, the first one will be uh, uh, a very basic uh, historical introduction to studies about uh, uh, visual uh, cognition, visual processing, uh, visual neural circuits. Um, uh, one of the exciting things about the, uh, about the summer course is that there's a wide diversity of students. Some of you are uh, really connoisseurs and, 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 and probably will, will know a lot of the things that I have to say in the introduction. Uh, some of, for some of you, maybe all of this is new. Um, so so this, this will be um, uh, very, very introductory uh, in nature at the beginning. Uh, then the second part, uh, so I'm, I'm, we're going to do a short break. Then the second part, uh, I'll tell you about um, uh, a couple of... Uh, uh, um, studies that we have recently conducted in, in, in our lab uh, at the intersection of uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, and neuroscience and cognitive science. Um, and, and then at the last part, uh, it will be a little bit of a Hilbert questions kind of a section. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Hilbert was a famous mathematician who uh, basically um, uh, came up with a, with a list of open questions in the field. This is similar to what Tommy was doing at the end, uh, talking about random questions. So this will be a sort of a disconnected series of discussions on topics that I hope will be controversial, provocative. And again, the goal is mostly to stimulate uh, uh, discussions to get people to... Uh, so, so again, the, the last part, uh, especially, I, I hope people will disagree. I, 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 you can disagree with everything I say from the very beginning, but, but especially the last part, uh, it's mostly meant to, to, to be provocative, to, to, to sort of come up with a couple of uh, several random uh, ideas, which I think are, are, are probably interesting for potential projects, but also for discussions and um, uh, along the way. Uh, okay, uh, so again, uh, please, please, please uh, stop me, interrupt me, uh, ask me questions uh, uh, along the way. I'll start. Uh, this um, probably all of you are quite uh, uh, intimately familiar with many of these uh, major accomplishments uh, in in, uh, in AI over the last uh, decade or, or so, uh, from very early successes in, in beating uh, Gary Kasparov uh, uh, in chess, all the way to uh, beating world champions in Go. We talked a little bit about uh, self-driving cars. Uh, Tommy argued that there would be a Nobel Prize for AlphaFold uh, for uh, um, the, the, uh, the set of algorithms that can um, basically uncover the three-dimensional uh, structure of uh, proteins. So, so this is uh, really, really uh, amazing and should not be minimized. Uh, we, we live in a, in a different world now than, than we did a decade ago. Uh, things are progressing incredibly fast, and, 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 and this, is, uh, uh, this is very exciting. Um, despite all of these uh, uh, major advances, um, uh, I think that the best is yet to come. Uh, I think that uh, what we are going to uh, see uh, in the next decade or the next two decades is even way more exciting than everything you see on the screen uh, right here. Um, I read a book uh, by Francis Crick, uh, uh, famous for his um, uh, discovery of the DNA double helix with Jim Watson. The book was called What Matt Pursued. And, and in that book, he tells the story of uh, one day when he was a kid, uh, he was reading um, some uh, scientific uh, um, um, article uh, about physics, uh, and, and he was very frustrated because he said uh, he started crying. He said, "By the time I grow up, everything will be discovered already. Uh, there will be nothing left for me to do." Um, so he, his mom went to him and said, "Well, don't worry. I'm sure there will be some interesting science for you to do when you grow up." So and so on. So so anyway, if you, if you think that this is impressive, uh, I, I think that. There's, there's, there's way more for, for, for you to do. Uh, and I, I hope you will be the ones uh, driving the discoveries uh, in, the, in, in the next decade, next two decades. Uh, and I think that what's, what's uh, yet to come is, is, is even more and more exciting than, than what we have uh, uh, right now. And, and part of that, uh, I think, will come from, uh, uh, from neuroscience and cognitive science. So my, my view, uh, also embraced by, by Tommy, and also by many others in, uh, in, in CBMM is that um, it, it's very exciting to, 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 do, uh, to, to have computer science, to, have, uh, uh, to develop algorithms and, and, and all kinds of hacks uh, that can do amazing things. But I think that the true fundamental revolutions uh, will really come from, uh, from, from, studying, uh, uh, from studying the brain. So I am particularly excited about the notion that we can discover uh, uh, um, uh, computations and, and, and the algorithms behind them. Uh, by, by scrutinizing what's happening uh, uh, inside brains, and then use those ideas uh, to, to, to come up with better AI. Uh, of course, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm reiterating some of the things that Tommy said, uh, 
getting better eye is not the only reason why I'm excited about studying brains. Uh, we also want to fix brains uh, when they don't work. As many of you probably know, mental health is, is one of the most serious issues in our nation. Uh, so in terms of clinical uh, considerations, so it's also quite important to understand how brains work. And, and to me, most important of, of all, uh, I think it's the most exciting and most profound uh, question in science uh, ever, understanding who we are, understanding the nature of, of, of our thoughts. So curiosity-driven discovery, I think, is, is, is perhaps the most important reason. But mo to, mo mostly today, I will talk about, uh, about this direction, about how, how we can think about algorithms, about some of the failures of current algorithms. Again, there, there are many successes, but I emphasize some of the failures of current algorithms and how, by, by studying uh, neurons and neural circuits and cognition, we can actually come up with uh, better, uh, better ideas in AI. OK, so this is, uh, this is the plan for today. Uh, I start with a very bas basic uh, historical introduction. Uh, then I go on to give uh, three examples of how neuroscience can inspire AI. AI. And I, I, I will end up with Hilbert questions, random questions, and, 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 and mostly uh, discussion. OK, so let me start uh, from the very, very beginning. I'll, I'll mostly focus on, on, on vision and, and, and visual recognition and, and visual cognition. Um, and, and part of the reason is because there has been a lot of work done in the field. We can stand on the shoulders of, uh, of previous giants. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's a perfect arena to, to, to understand uh, intelligence. For sure, understanding vision is not all of intelligence. There's all kinds of uh, important questions in AI that have nothing to do with vision or that transcend vision in many ways. But, but, but I will focus on, on, on questions about visual processing today. So to, to start from the very beginning, um, uh, about uh, 3,500 million years ago, uh, uh, evolution basically advanced the, the, the idea of capturing light uh, in the form of energy. Uh, and, and there are bacteria that could capture light and, and do photosynthesis uh, 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 many, many years ago. But that, that's not really what we mean by, by vision. The, the real revolution, uh, in a way, uh, came about 500 million years ago in a period called the Cambrian uh, uh, Explosion. So these uh, creatures here, uh, which are called uh, trilobites, I'm not sure about the pronunciation. As you know, I have a very thick accent. I mispronounce most words. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that one. I think it's trilobites. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in any case, so these are the first creatures where there's some fossil evidence of eyes. These structures that you see here uh, are presumably the eyes of this, uh, this creature. So this was, this was the first time, basically, where uh, uh, um, uh, animals could start to use light to convey and detect uh, uh, information. And there is a, a, a scientist uh, at Oxford, Andrew Parker, who came up with the idea of the light switch theory. He argues that by being able to capture light and use light to detect uh, information and understand what's happening in the environment, this gave rise to uh, uh, essentially an explosion and the diversity of animal uh, uh, species on Earth uh, basically arose due to, due to the, the evolution of the visual system. Uh, uh, nothing travels faster than the speed of light, so all of a sudden uh, we could have um, uh, detect uh, prey and predators. So this gave rise to, to an arms race, basically, in the evolution of animal species. So, so the, the emergence of eyes basically coincides uh, with, the, with the major explosion of, uh, uh, in the diversity of animal species. Most of the species we know today uh, basically can be traced back to this uh, enormous diversity that started uh, in the Cambrian uh, uh, period, and, and that coincides with, uh, with, the, uh, with the first evidence for, for um, uh, using light uh, to, to capture information. Um, so to study uh, visual uh, cognition, uh, uh, David Marr, uh, one of the fathers of the field of uh, visual processing, together with Tommy Poggio, came up with this idea of three levels of analysis, arguing that to understand vision, and I would contend to understand anything about cognition in general, uh, we need to understand the problems at three different levels. So uh, they refer to the computational level, what the problem is, the algorithmic levels, that is how animals solve it, uh, and the implementational level. Okay, and I roughly map this onto understanding behavior, uh, understanding neurons, and understanding the algorithms uh, as a way of bridging between uh, neurons and, 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 and behavior. So throughout, uh, I'll, I'll mostly try to talk about uh, uh, these three levels, about, uh, about neurons, and about circuits, uh, and then also about uh, behavior, uh, and, and at the same time about uh, uh, algorithms and, and, and the implementation. 
So the first thing to point out, and, and one of the first entry points into understanding vision is the notion that vision is, an, uh, uh, is a construct. We think, uh, uh, naively speaking, that vision is just a reflection of what's out there in the world. Uh, there's plenty of visual illusions that show that this is not the case, okay? So I'll flash this very quickly. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, probably here uh, you can see one of the green circles uh, that, that seems to be larger than the other. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this very quickly. Uh, raise your hand if you think that the circle on the, the, the green circle on the right is larger. Uh, even though, you know, I'm tricking you, just, just your, the perceptual appearance. So, so this is pretty strong, right? So, um, of course, this is a trick, right? So they're, they're, they're both the same. Uh, uh, here's another one. Uh, all of you are probably way too young to see this. This was done by Pavan Sina at MIT. Uh, the gentleman here on the right was uh, former President Bill Clinton. And when you look at this picture, most people think that the person on the left was Al Gore, uh, who was the, uh, the vice president at the time. Uh, it turns out that it's not. It's actually just a replica of Clinton's face, copied and pasted. But because of the context, because of the, the, different, the different clothing and the position of the two, most people think that it's uh, 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 Bill Clinton and, and, and Gore. Uh, okay, so if you do this, you can sort of see that it's actually exactly the same face. This is another famous one. Many of you probably have seen this. This is called the Margaret Thatcher uh, uh, illusion. Uh, if you look at these two faces uh, upside down, they look more or less the same. Uh, but then, then when you turn them uh, uh, around 180 degrees, you think that they're, they're completely different. So in any case, these are uh, just uh, three examples of many visual illusions. Uh, just to argue that what we see is, uh, is, is a construct, it's an invention. Our brains are making up stories about what's, uh, what, what's out there. Okay? There's lots of things that's, that, are, that are happening here that we don't see. Uh, just as a very simple example, there's tons of uh, infrared and ultraviolet radiation, and, and, and we, we just cannot sense it, okay? So there's, there's a reality out there that we don't see. And, and, and a lot of things that we think we see are, are just illusions, are, are, are just uh, things that our brains uh, uh, make up, okay? Um, so so this, this is yet another example. Um, uh, uh, probably if many of you are familiar with this. Uh, just raise your hand quickly if you see uh, white and gold uh, for the color. Okay, so all of you are right, everybody else is wrong. That's how I see it. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, basically it's more, more or less half and half. Uh, um, what, what is it that the other people see? It's blue? Uh, black and blue. Black and blue, okay, yeah. So I, I can, I, for the life of me, I cannot see black and blue. So black and blue, yeah, so there's a lot of black and blue here. All of you are wrong, of course. Uh, uh, so th this is, it's, it's mostly, so this is yet another illustration of the fact that uh, you know, vision and our perception uh, is in the brain of the beholder. In the brain, not, not the eye. The eye has nothing to do. I'm pretty sure that uh, our eyes, all of our eyes, are very, very similar to each other. So some, something's happening in our cortex, in our brain, uh, that's dictating that some of you see it in one color and the others are seeing this in, uh, in a different color. Okay? Uh, all right. So let, let's say that we want to figure out how a car works. Uh, we, we can start with, uh, and, and let's say that you come from uh, Mars and, and you figure out that there is uh, interesting con contraptions out there. They're, they're called cars. We want to figure out how they work. So we can start with behavior. So we can understand that the car moves. Uh, it also makes sounds. Uh, uh, we can, uh, it has different speeds. Uh, there are constraints in how it turns, okay? Uh, we can also look at how it works from the outside. So we can do things like uh, measure the average temperature over five, five minutes and uh, every three inches. So we can get the frequency spectrum of the sounds from the motor and so on. Um, it's also very useful to, to use uh, sort of lesion studies. So if there are no wheels, the car doesn't work. Uh, we can discover that if there is no gas, it doesn't work. But ultimately, to really understand what's happening, we need to open the hood, okay? So we need to study each component. And so I'll, I'll give you a very brief history of uh, uh, the, the, the heroic uh, uh, efforts over the last five decades or so to try to open up the hood and see what's happening inside the brain uh, during visual processing. Okay, so the, the very first, just to start from the very beginning, light is reflected on objects, and, and, and that reflection uh, uh, reaches the eyes. Uh, light is then converted essentially into an electrical signal. That electrical signal travels all the way back to, to cortex, and cortex is where all the magic happens, and, and, and where uh, we're going to be mostly talking about what happens in cortex in the context of uh, vision. There's a lot of exciting processing happening already at the level of the uh, 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 of the retina. But largely our perception, uh, as I argued earlier, is mostly dictated by what happens in, 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 in cortex. This, this idea that light is reflected on objects and, and, and then the brain 
process is, is pretty obvious to all of you. Uh, it was not always the case. It took uh, humanity uh, tens of thousands of years to, to arrive to this conclusion. Uh, uh, lucid uh, scholars, uh, uh, many of the Greeks, for example, thought that it was the other way around. They thought that the eyes were actually sending rays uh, uh, onto, on, on, onto the objects. And there, there are many uh, uh, sort of other theories that people had about how, uh, how vision works. Uh, but a few centuries ago, people converged on this idea that light is reflected in objects, it reaches the eyes, and, and that's how uh, processing starts. So one of the main ways in which we can start to study brains is by uh, looking at the, the, the uh, unfortunate uh, consequences of uh, lesions uh, uh, onto the brain. So here are two examples uh, of that. These are two pretty famous examples. Uh, many of you may be familiar with them. Uh, the first one here on the left is um, uh, a person that, uh, 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 th that's known as HM. Um, and this person had uh, epilepsy, had seizures. And because of these seizures, the, the, the treatment at the time was to uh, surgically remove uh, uh, both sides, on, on, on both sides of the brain, uh, the hippocampus. Not, not just the hippocampus, hippocampus and surrounding structures, but mostly it's a bilateral uh, excision of the, of the hippocampus uh, structures. So that worked uh, well in terms of seizures. Uh, so this person uh, uh, did not have seizures. Uh, this person could still see the world and recognize uh, uh, chairs and objects and, 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 and cars and faces and so on. Uh, but then very soon it, was, uh, uh, it became apparent that this person could not convert short-term memories into long-term memories. So maybe some of you have seen Finding Nemo, Dory, uh, is, uh, has, uh, has the same problem. Uh, people who have uh, severe Alzheimer's uh, uh, may have the same problem. You can have a, a very nice conversation with them. Uh, and then five minutes later, they forget absolutely uh, uh, everything. Um, so so this, is, uh, this gave rise to the whole study of, of hippocampus uh, neurophysiology, of the whole study of long-term memories. Uh, the Nobel Prize in 2014 to John O'Keefe can ultimately be traced back to, uh, to this um, clinical mistake, if you will, of uh, removing the hippocampus on both sides of the, uh, of the brain. Uh, removing it from both sides, incidentally, is, is critical uh, for, to, to, to give uh, rise to these uh, memory deficits. Uh, even today, there are many cases where, do, uh, where neurosurgeons still do unilateral excisions, meaning that they remove the hippocampus only on one side. And, uh, and by and large, and we can debate about this, by and large, people don't have memory problems when you only remove one of the hippocampus and the other one is intact. The other example here is a famous book by uh, uh, a great neurologist and writer, uh, uh, Oliver Sacks. Uh, Oliver Sacks, uh, in this case, he, he wrote about many neurological patients. Uh, this particular one is about uh, a man who literally mistook his wife for a hat. This is a person who has a, con a very, very rare condition that mostly nobody knows uh, outside the, the confines of uh, um, psychology departments and neuroscience departments, known as prosopagnosia. This is a condition where people cannot recognize faces. Uh, they can uh, recognize uh, um, uh, chairs and, and, and cars and all kinds of other objects, but not uh, faces. It's interesting to know that people may not even know that they have this condition. I once met a person with prosopagnosia, um, and this, this was a professor at a prominent uh, uh, university uh, doing very, very well in computer science. And he only learned about the fact that he had prosopagnosia when he was uh, uh, in, his, uh, in his 30s, basically. He could recognize people by, by their gait, by how they walk, by their clothes, by their voice, in all sorts of ways. He didn't know that people used uh, actually facial features uh, to, to recognize uh, uh, others. Uh, so studying lesions is one of the main entry points uh, to, to actually begin to figure out uh, under the hood what's happening inside the brain. Uh, and so uh, fast forward uh, a couple of decades, uh, we now have uh, a lot of information about the mesoscopic uh, connectivity of different areas uh, in, uh, in, in, in visual cortex. This is a famous diagram by Feliman and Vanessen. This diagram is based on, uh, on, on the uh, macaque monkey primate uh, brain. We know much more about uh, 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 neuroanatomy in, in monkeys than, uh, than, than in humans. Uh, for, for it's, it's very, very hard to do real serious neuroanatomy uh, in, in, in humans. So this diagram, uh, at the very bottom, you have this uh, RGC structure. That's the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, information from there goes to another structure called the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus. 
from there onto a structure called V1, and then onto many different brain areas. Each of these boxes corresponds to a different brain area that's involved in processing visual information. At the very top of this hierarchy, Fellerman and Vanessen put the hippocampus. HC stands for the hippocampus. Uh, I think the hippocampus, and then also you have the ER, the entorhinal cortex, these are not purely visual areas. So uh, even though they are the pinnacle of this diagram, I think they're not, they're not strictly visual areas. But every other box here is a visual area. You can record the activity of neurons and they respond to visual stimuli. Lesions, if you, if you make a lesion in one of these boxes, uh, people have some sort of uh, uh, visual deficit. Uh, in particular, of course, if you don't have the retina, you cannot see at all. Uh, if you don't have V1, uh, uh, major lesions that distract V1 also render people uh, uh, completely uh, blind. So we know that each one of these boxes is, uh, uh, is involved in visual processing. A huge chunk of the primate brain is devoted to processing uh, uh, visual, uh, uh, visual information. We are visual creatures. So just a couple of numbers to throw there. Uh, in the human brain, there are about 10 to the 11 neurons. Uh, each neuron makes about uh, 10 to the 4 connections or synapses. So there are about 10 to the 15 connections in the human brain. This is in total. This is not just a visual system. This is the entire number of neurons. Uh, so just uh, uh, by way of comparison, uh, the population of Earth is on the order of uh, 10 to the 10. Um, and I don't know how to measure connections, but uh, let, let's say that we defined uh, how many uh, contacts you have in, in Snapchat or Facebook or uh, in, in any other proxy for, for connectivity that you want to use for, for human connections. Let's say it's about 10 to the 12. Maybe there are some very popular people, uh, and, and maybe this is 10 to 13, I don't know. But uh, in any case, each one of our brains uh, has way more complexity in terms of number of units, in terms of connectivity, uh, than the entire human, than, than the entire uh, 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 interactome of uh, humans uh, on Earth. Okay. All right, so, so th this connectivity that I mentioned is uh, what I call mesoscopic connectivity. This is one area connecting to another. One of the tremendously exciting things that are happening right now in neuroscience is that we are beginning to be able to uh, uh, elucidate the microscopic uh, connectivity of, uh, of, of neural circuits. That means to know exactly which neuron connects to which other neuron uh, at, uh, at, at, at the highest possible uh, resolution. And so we'll, we'll have a lecture uh, in a couple of days by one of the world leaders in this effort, which is known as connectomics. Uh, Jeff Lichtman, he, he gives uh, amazing talks. I think you're going to, uh, to love that. Uh, I hope you'll be able to, to, to interact with, with him and ask him lots of questions. So one of the things that uh, Jeff and many others are doing is uh, taking uh, small parts of neural circuits and then coming up with uh, uh, basically a complete diagram of, of connectivity in those, uh, in, in those circuits. So uh, we are very, very far from having that kind of diagram for uh, primate species. Uh, even even rodent uh, species. Uh, interestingly, as a side comment, uh, we we've had the, the entire connectome for for the worm for say the C. elegans uh, worm, and despite having the connectome, it's still extremely exciting and very difficult to understand what the computations are. And if people are interested, you can talk to Cheng Wan over there, who's an expert on 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 on, on, on these. Uh, she's saying no, but, but she is. Uh, anyway, so, so having, having, having the connectome, uh, uh, in that case, uh, 302 neurons, is not, uh, does not immediately translate into understanding uh, computation. There's, there's still pl plenty to do. But I think this is a, an Im incredible roadmap that we're going to have uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's different from, uh, that, that will really uh, jumpstart uh, uh, a lot of uh, detailed investigations of neural circuits and hopefully also of uh, helping us understand computations uh, that we didn't have uh, before. So I, I want to take a quick tangent to talk about the fact that in humans, uh, uh, w people are beginning to do neuroanatomical connections, but we don't have any kind of diagram of mesoscopic connectivity similar to the one we have in, in monkeys. So one of the things we did recently, and I'll mention this very briefly, is try to uh, look at uh, functional interactions between different parts of the human brain. So we have been collaborating for, for, for many years now with neurosurgeons who implant electrodes inside the human brain uh, to try to understand uh, different aspects of, cognitions in the, uh, of cognition uh, in the human brain from the inside. So this is similar to, uh, 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 these are people who have pharmacologically intractable epilepsy similar to the patient HM that I mentioned earlier. 
So before they try to remove the part of the brain that's responsible for the seizures, they try to map the different, uh, um, uh, the different brain areas and to try to find out where the epileptogenic focus uh, is. So for that purpose, neurosurgeons put electrodes inside the human brain and, and the, the patients typically stay for, for about one week in the hospital. And during this one week, we have the unique opportunity to examine and scrutinize uh, activity in the human brain in awake patients while they uh, eat and drink and, and, and do psychophysics and do cognitive tasks and, 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 and do all sorts of things. And, and this allows us to, 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 to really begin to, to see what's happening under the hood uh, uh, inside the human brain. Um, in some cases, uh, and this is going to be a bit technical, happy to talk more if people are interested, uh, um, depending on the type of electrode that's being used, uh, in some cases uh, we have been using what are called microwires. These are 40 micron diameter, high impedance uh, uh, electrodes, similar to the ones that are used in animal models to study neural activity. And then we can get action potentials. The action potentials are the fundamental currency, the fundamental way in which neurons uh, communicate uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout cortex. Uh, in other cases, we have uh, what are called um, uh, stereo or ECOG type of electrodes. These are two millimeters, huge electrodes that have very low impedance. And from those electrodes, we can get field potential activity, but not the activity of uh, uh, individual neurons. So one of the things uh, 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 that in the lab, Jerry Wong did, um, was to take data from many of these uh, patients collected over uh, uh, nearly a decade, and then look at the correlations in activity between different electrodes. I'm not going to go into the details. If people are interested, I would be happy to talk more about this. But this gave rise to uh, what we call the functional interactome of the, uh, of, of the human brain. So this gives us an idea of which area of the human brain correlates with uh, which other area of the human brain. This is different from the Feldman and Benesen diagram. That's, that's anatomy. This is physiology. This is at the physiological level, uh, who talks to whom. Which area of the human brain correlates with which other area of the, of the human brain. Incidentally, Jerry was a student in this summer course, uh, I forgot, maybe four or five years ago. Uh, and, uh, and, and he started working on this at that, uh, at that time. Uh, anyway, so uh, I, I won't say anything more about this. If people are interested, I'm happy to discuss this in, in more detail. This is a way of trying to look at something similar to the Feldman and Vanessa diagram, but in the context of uh, uh, physiological measurements from, from humans. So just to uh, uh, go back a couple of decades now, uh, the fundamental revolution in neuros, people have been thinking about uh, brains for, for, for centuries. The main revolution happened uh, about, uh, in, in about 1927. Edgar Adrian got the Nobel Prize for figuring out how to uh, insert electrodes to record the activity of uh, individual neurons. Fast forward a few decades. This is a picture by, uh, a schematic picture by uh, uh, Huvel and Wiesel at the, at the Harvard Medical School. They also got a Nobel Prize for using these electrodes to probe the, probe the activity of neurons in primary visual cortex. So this gave, uh, this, this, uh, the ability to interrogate the activity of individual neurons uh, and gave rise to heroic investigations over the last uh, five decades or so, where people poked electrodes in different parts of the brain, mostly in, in cats and rodents and, and, and monkeys, uh, uh, to try to figure out what neurons are doing, how neurons respond to different types of visual stimulation. So uh, just being unfair to, to people who work on this for, for, for decades, just to give a very quick overview of, uh, of, of, of what happened uh, in, in, in seven decades of visual neurophysiology, uh, summarizing that in, in, in one minute. Uh, Stephen Kuffler uh, started recording the activity of neurons in the retina. Uh, he recorded the activity of retinal ganglion cells. Together with other people, he was one of the uh, first to describe what are called receptive fields. The notion that there are neurons in the retina that tile the entire receptive field, the, the entire visual field, and they have a localized part of the of the visual field that they respond to. So there may be a neuron. If I'm fixating, I'm not moving my eyes. Let's say that I'm fixating on on that projector over there. There's a neuron that's uh, in charge of uh, describing what's happening here. Another one here. Another one here, etc. So the entire set of neurons in, uh, in 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 the retina have receptive fields that tile the entire uh, visual field. Uh, Hubel and Wiesel, who studied with, uh, with, with, with Stephen Kuffler, um, um, have the, um, uh, decided to go into cortex, into the terra incognita of, of, of cortex, uh, and, and record the activity of, of, of neurons uh, in, in, in primary visual cortex uh, while presenting different stimuli, initially with anesthetized cats, and then uh, uh, later on moving on to, to, to monkeys. Um, 
you can uh, we, we can discuss about the philosophy of science about uh, whether science should be hypothesis driven or not. Uh, I always like to quote uh, David Hubel saying that the most sophisticated hypothesis he ever had in his entire life was this that if I put an electrode in, in, in V1 something interesting will happen. Uh, lo and behold uh, they, they, they spent, uh, these, these were really uh, heroic experiments. They would spend day and night during, uh, once they had the animal anesthetized, they would uh, then sacrifice the animal. So once they had it, they had a neuron, they had to go work continuously around the clock, basically. So they, they worked for days, uh, uh, recording the activity of neurons. And mostly they were using uh, the same kind of stimuli, uh, light on or off, that Stephen Kufler was, uh, was using. Uh, after, after one of these, these experiments, in those days, they didn't have computers to present visual stimuli. Uh, so they, they had slides. Most of you are probably too, too, too young to know what a slide is. Uh, basically, this is a, a small rectangular uh, uh, display where they would put it, that in a projector, and that would project onto, uh, onto a screen. So they realized, uh, mostly in a serendipitous manner, uh, uh, and luck always favors the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, those who are really working hard and, and, and people who have very strong powers of observation, they realized that the neuron went like crazy every time they put the slide in and out. It didn't matter very much what the content was. What would really matter was putting the slide into the projector and out of the projector. And that's how they discovered that what the neuron was really responding to was the edge uh, uh, basically between the slide and the, and, and the projector and the, and, and, and the movement of inserting and removing. So that, that gave rise to, to studying and discovering the fact that there are neurons in primary visual cortex that, uh, res that are tuned to different uh, orientations. So here, for example, uh, if you have a bar that's horizontally oriented, the neuron uh, essentially doesn't care. And if you have a neuron that has a vertical orientation or, 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 or this uh, slanted orientation, uh, the neuron goes like crazy and starts firing. So that, that was the discovery of orientation tuning that, uh, uh, that they got a Nobel Prize for, 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 the, for this work. Uh, and, and that gave rise to uh, 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 gener a whole generation of people uh, studying visual cortex. I think it's fair to say that everything we know about the visual system can ultimately be traced back to these uh, heroic investigations. Okay, so um, roughly speaking, people divide the visual system into two paths, the temporal pathway, the, the, uh, uh, also known as the what pathway, mostly involved in visual object recognition, the dorsal pathway that's mostly involved with where things are, with movement, with stereo information. If you put electrodes in the dorsal pathway, for example, a famous area called MT, uh, there are neurons that respond very vigorously to motion, and they, they can discriminate whether things are moving to the right or to the left, and, 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 and all kinds of uh, uh, aspects of uh, motion uh, processing. Uh, and then Bob Desimone, working with Charlie Gross, discovered that there are neurons that respond to very complex objects, for example, neurons that respond to faces. Uh, and those are mostly located uh, in these areas called the, the inferior temporal cortex uh, uh, in, in, in here. Um, Okay, so again, most of what we know about the visual system comes from study in animals. I want to very quickly tell you about, uh, 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 about the human brain. Uh, again, uh, working with these uh, patients with, uh, with epilepsy, we can begin to interrogate what happens in the human brain when we present uh, visual stimuli. This is an example of uh, an intracranial field potential recording. This is not individual neurons. This is a field potential recording uh, in an area that we think is analogous to the macaque monkey inferior temporal cortex. Uh, we refer to this as the inferior temporal gyrus. And here, what you're seeing uh, is the intracranial field potential uh, in one of these electrodes in response to the presentation of a picture of a face. Here on the y-axis is the intracranial field potential in microvolts. On the x-axis you have time. This is uh, uh, the, the onset time. This is 150 milliseconds. You can see that there are very strong and reliable responses uh, uh, upon presentation of this, uh, this stimuli. Here you have uh, uh, another example, uh, uh, another example electrode. Here showing you every single individual trial. There's no massaging of any flavor here. This is raw data. You can see that in every single trial, there's a deflection in voltage happening roughly uh, at about 150 milliseconds uh, uh, after stimulus onset uh, that, that correlates very strongly with the visual stimuli. So by and large, what we are discovering in the human uh, ventral visual cortex parallels what we understand from uh, 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 from non-human animals, and, 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 and basically reflects a very rapid, highly selective, and transformation in variant uh, set of responses to, uh, to different uh, stimuli. 
I want to uh, very quickly flash this uh, because uh, uh, people often ask me about this, uh, about this neuron. Um, this is the neuron that's in an area of the brain that I would not call uh, visual cortex. This is at that very, very top of that uh, uh, Vanessa and Philemon and Vanessa diagram. This is a neuron that, in this particular example, is located in the, in, in the amygdala. Uh, uh, in the human brain. Uh, we've also recorded from similar neurons in, in other areas, uh, the interrenal cortex and the, and the hippocampus. And this is a case where we recorded activity of individual neurons. We were presented mul presenting multiple different pictures. And, and again, in a, in a completely serendipitous fashion, uh, we found this example neuron that responded in a pretty uh, peculiar way. Uh, uh, what you're seeing here, for those of you who are not used to these kind of uh, diagrams, uh, these dots here correspond to action potentials. Each dot is, is a single action potential from, from one neuron. Each row corresponds to one trial. So for example, here you have nine different trials when the subject was looking at this, uh, uh, at this rabbit, okay? And you can see that the neuron uh, did not fire too much. Why did the neuron fire at all? Well, all neurons essentially have uh, uh, some rate of spontaneous activity. Uh, there, there's basically no such thing as a neuron that's completely silent. So even if a neuron doesn't care all about the rabbit, there's still some, some, some spikes. And this is prevalent uh, throughout, uh, uh, th throughout cortex uh, in all kinds of species that, we have, um, that the people have studied. And we can debate about what's happening there. Why, why is there spontaneous activity? Why do neurons fire uh, uh, all the time? It's quite expensive to fire. It costs energy. Uh, so we can debate about why, why that happens. That's, that's a fascinating in question in and of itself. In any case, so we present this picture nine times, uh, the neuron doesn't, doesn't seem to, to, to care. Um, we present other pictures of faces, the neuron doesn't seem to care at all. And then, uh, again, in a completely serendipitous fashion, we realize that the neuron fire quite vigorously to these three different pictures of uh, Bill Clinton. Here there are 15 different pictures. In this particular experiment, we presented about 50, five zero different, uh, different pictures. What's quite remarkable here is that these three different pictures are are quite distinct from each other. One is a black and white drawing. Uh, the other one is a color photograph. Uh, the other one, you probably cannot see anything from, from, from your distance, but Bill Clinton is standing up. You can barely see his face. He's uh, shaking hands with, uh, uh, with, with someone else. Uh, and, and so despite the fact that these are completely different, the neurons seem to uh, somehow selectively respond to these uh, different images. This, uh, this is work that we did a very long time ago. Um, I still don't know why this neuron responds in this way. Um, one of the limitations in this kind of experiments is that uh, we have a very limited time uh, with, with, with each neuron. So we cannot exhaustively sample the visual system of space. And I will come back to this at the very end. So this is a very serious methodological concern uh, in, in all of the studies about vision. Uh, we present a random set of uh, images uh, or, or, or an informed set of images uh, or, 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 or a set of images that is guided by our intuitions, by, uh, um, by previous work, uh, et cetera. But at the end of the day, uh, we don't have a full mathematical proof or an exhaustive uh, uh, sampling of the entire uh, uh, set of uh, different uh, types of images. So I don't know why this neuron responds in this way, uh, and, and, and I'm happy to talk uh, more about uh, this. And, uh... Okay, um, yes. So, uh, did you also find other neurons which were selectively responding to some other images? Indeed, indeed, yes. So that, that, that's a great question. So, I, I'm just highlighting one, one example neuron. Um, there, there, there's, there's another neuron that responded to, to, to Jennifer Aniston. Uh, there, there was another neuron that, that responded to, to the White House. Uh, uh, and and this, this gave rise to whole industry. Uh, 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 there are lots of people who followed up on, the, on this type of uh, work. Uh, this, there, there are neurons that seem to be highly selective and highly specific. Not, not all neurons. There are the neurons that respond to, to all chairs or to, to all faces. or They are much less uh, picky uh, compared to, to this one. But yes, this is not the one neuron. There, uh, the, 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 there are tens, uh, uh, maybe hundreds by now, of, of neurons that people have described. Still a very small sample. Uh, and, 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 and very anecdotal in a way. Uh, but, but this is not the only one. There are, there are many other neurons uh, that, that, that do respond in a very selective way. Casper. Do you have a sense of how many neurons someone would need to screen through before they can find one that responds to something in like an interpretable way? way that, 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 that's, that, that, that's a great question. And I, I can refer to a paper where uh, uh, people try to estimate that. So, so what are the odds? Uh, you, you're randomly listening to, to, to a neuron. What are the odds? 
that you would find such a thing. Um, so, so a couple of things. So, um, and, and, and these are mostly conjectures. I think there's, so, so there's, this, uh, there's a study there where people got, uh, tried to estimate these numbers and they said, well, uh, the, the probability may be around 5% of finding such numbers. There's, there's a lot of assumptions in these calculations. So one, one thing that I should point out is, I think that most of these neurons do not seem to be in visual cortex. These neurons in the amygdala, the textbook version of what the amygdala does is uh, that it's involved in emotion processing. So it's conceivable that this neuron is not really selected for Bill Clinton. Maybe the person loved Bill Clinton, they thought that, uh, that, that he was uh, funny, or they hated him, or maybe they thought that he was cute, or, or maybe they were uh, uh, Democrats, or th there, there are all kinds of uh, uh, interpretations that transcend uh, visual processing. The other point I want to make is that these kind of very selective invariant responses have mostly been described for uh, famous things. Uh, for famous landmarks and famous uh, 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 and famous people, much more so than uh, uh, than, than than a new object, uh, let's say. So the conjecture there is that there may be an overrepresentation uh, that's uh, uh, dependent on the statistics of, of stimuli that people are exposed to. Th this recording was done in the year 2000, uh, where people maybe have been uh, this patient had been watching Bill Clinton on TV for the last four years every day. So it may be that the statistics of, uh, of, of, of uh, exposure to a stimulus uh, to, to, to the world uh, may influence uh, uh, how, many, how many neurons respond uh, in this way. So it's, it may be possible that um, if I meet a new person today, uh, I will not have a, a representation of uh, lots and lots of neurons uh, uh, unless I, I, I get to know that person. So, so there may be something special about uh, about your family, about your friends, uh, 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 about wives, about kids, about uh, Bill Clinton, uh, about the White House, uh, and, and there, there may be an overrepresentation of those uh, of those things. So, not, not a very good answer, but that, that, that's that's a couple of points I want to make. Tiago, yeah. would it that be also uh, due to sample bias? Because from what I remember from the studies, these were patients mostly in LA, and they had like limited time to record, so they chose you know images of famous people because they would be more likely. So there was that's why all of the the neurons that have been found that you know either actors or from residents or so it's very very plausible. Uh, let, let me just tell you a couple of more anecdotal points. Uh, but I, I think this this I, I was the person running actually this experiment. Uh, this was a bug in my code. Uh, I, I was not I, I was uh, uh, presenting uh, all kinds of images. And I wanted to present each image only one. So I was not trying. There were some famous people, uh, but there were all, all, a lot of other uh, uh, stimuli uh, 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 as well. So, so in this case, I, I, I wasn't really trying to uh, find. But, but, but indeed, the, the work that, that, that followed up on this uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, was uh, basically had this conjecture that famous people would be more interesting. And therefore, there is a, there is a sampling bias there, I think. I think that's true. I think most of the, uh, the, the disproportionate number of famous landmarks and, and, and famous uh, images. Um, I, I want to come back to this because I think that now with the, with the advent of uh, computational models, we have much better ways of probing uh, uh, neuronal responses. And, and of course, you are very familiar with this, being Shu here also. Uh, so I, I want to come back to, to some of the more modern ways in which we have, I think, to try to probe neural responses. Uh, so I, I think there was minimal bias in this particular neuron. In general, most of what people did after this, I think, yes, people uh, were really uh, there was a very high prevalence of a famous uh, object. In this case, uh, uh, I, I was presenting these kind of stimuli. I was presenting all sorts of things. Yes, th th there were many famous people, but, uh, but, but, but I was not really looking for, 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 for that. But, but I still think that, that, that there may be a sampling bias. I think that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Yes? So I, uh, have you found the amount of other patients that you have to So maybe it would be a case of it could be a what? A face representation. Face representation. Yes. So, so th th this particular one, I think it's 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 not about faces. Uh, so I, I I find it very hard to think that this is really faces. So then here there are other faces that neuron does not respond to. I meant face representation. The face. State. 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 Oh, the state like like being happy or not, for example. Is that? Is that yeah, a, what, what oh, yeah. Are are the the, 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 the you know, 
or the, the, the government or Democrats or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 yes, absolutely. So, so, I, again, I, I, I don't want to claim that I understand what's going on here. I, I, I certainly don't. So, a lot of people ask, uh, would these neurons also respond to, to the White House? Would these neurons respond to Hillary Clinton? I've been asked whether this neuron responds to, uh, would respond to uh, Monica Lewinsky. Some of you may know the story. I, I, I don't the answer to all of these questions. I don't know. Uh, so, so, so we really, uh, the, the, many of these experiments, like a lot of experiments in visual neurophysiology, have been pretty, pretty random, I would say. We, we, we throw a lot of pictures and we hope for the best. Um, so I, it, it may very well be that, uh, that this is connected to emotions. It may be connected to, 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 to a state, to, to, to politicians. Th there are other politicians here. This is, um, I don't know if you can see it from there. Uh, this is Kennedy. Uh, this is Washington. Uh, but anyway, th th this is mostly speculation. I, I, I'd love to come back to this after I tell you about, uh, uh, I'll briefly mention in the third part uh, what I think is a better way to try to probe uh, neuron responses than than blindly showing pictures and hoping for the best, um, which is what most people have been doing in a way. All right. Um, OK, so if we really want to understand, what, what does it even mean to understand uh, uh, cortex or, 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 or computations? So together with many of my colleagues, I fully embrace the notion that, uh, that was put forward by, by Richard Feynman here and many others before him as well. Uh, uh, Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize, uh, very famous uh, physicist. Uh, he said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Uh, by create, I, uh, uh, I interpret that to mean mathematics. I interpret that to mean uh, rigorous theories and computational models. I think if we are going to understand anything about brains, uh, we really need to do that in the, in the language of, of science, which is the language of, uh, of, of mathematics. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, 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 a very, very brief introduction to, to, to computational uh, models, just to have uh, everybody on the same page. Um, an image, an, an, an image recognition, has to do with uh, taking an input that's just a bunch of numbers, and then uh, understanding what, what what what's in there. Okay, so this this may not be obvious uh, to people who have never thought about computer vision, but for all of you, I think this is uh, 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 of course uh, pretty pretty trivial, right? So you look at an image like that, and of course you see a flower. The input, what's actually happening, more or less at the level of the retina is that you have a bunch of numbers. That's, that's what represents the image. In particular, if we convert, if we remove color for, 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 for the moment, uh, an image is just a matrix, a two-dimensional matrix with numbers that represent the intensity of each uh, pixel. To a very, very, very coarse, oversimplified approximation, we can think that the output of the retina, of the retinal ganglion cells, the fine rate of, uh, of, of retinal ganglion cells, is some sort of representation of the intensity of uh, each location. This is a very unfair way of describing the retina. There are many of my uh, beloved colleagues that spend their lives working on understanding the detailed intricacy of the circuit in the retina. There's much more to the retina than this kind of representation. But to a first approximation, many of us think of the input to, to, to cortex as, as, as a bunch of numbers. Okay? So you look at this, and you have to look at these numbers and say, that's a flower. Okay? And th that's, that's a pretty, pretty hard task. Okay? That's, that's, that's what we mean by by building computational models. People did not, so some, so some of you may have seen this. Uh, 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 again, I apologize. I, I know some of these things are, are, are deja vu for, for, for many of you. Um, Seymour Puppert was a very famous uh, uh, computer scientist and, and, and cognitive scientist uh, uh, working at MIT. Uh, very, very lucid guy. Uh, many, many of us, uh, when we, we love to work with, with, with students. We have summer students. There are summer projects. Uh, MIT has had uh, the Europe uh, projects and summer uh, projects uh, for, for, for forever. Uh, this was uh, in the uh, 1960s. Uh, he proposed as a summer project, he said, we're, we're going to solve vision, essentially, by creating uh, a, a computer uh, uh, that, that can recognize uh, images. This was the summary, the abstract for, for the project. He said, well, we'll get a bunch of uh, smart MIT undergrads, and, and, and this summer we're, we're going to solve the, the, the problem of uh, vision. Uh, this is the vision memo number 100. We still uh, there are still uh, uh, memos uh, at, at MIT. They, uh, I think they became a little bit uh, less fashionable these days now that we have so many other ways of communicating science. Uh, in those days, the, the, those uh, memos 
uh, were one of the ways in which people communicated. So this is AI memo, uh, the vision memo 100. Uh, you can, um, um, the people thought that we could solve the problem in, in, in one summer. Um, this, this was, uh, like, 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 like many of us, uh, uh, perhaps a bit overly ambitious, but uh, anyway. Um, so, so I, I want to just uh, put a couple of uh, uh, basic guidelines of what we mean by understanding. And, and this, this is an interesting point that maybe will lead to, to further discussions, and I hope it will. Um, not, not everybody agrees on what it means to understand uh, uh, brains or understand computation. So I, I'd like to put forward a couple of uh, basic uh, uh, requirements, uh, a desiderata for, for, for a theory of, of visual processing. The first one is that it has to be image computable. We need to be able to take an image, uh, and, and that by that I mean a matrix of numbers, uh, and then and then do processing on that. Uh, th this may be again obvious to many of you. Um, th there are many theories that are not image computable. Uh, there, there are many uh, in, in psychology, for example. There are many people who have beautiful uh, ideas about how the brain might work. They may be correct. Uh, they may be very uh, very good. But they're not image computable. You cannot really have an input and, and manipulate it and, and and do things with it. So so that that's what I mean by by, by image computable. Uh, I personally think that it has to be based on biologically plausible mechanisms. That is, I'm particularly interested in how the brain works. Uh, this is also not universal. There are lots of people who are interested in uh, building vision systems that just work. And that's very laudable. And, 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 and I, 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 I applaud those efforts as well. Uh, Google may care about having a, a vision system that can describe anything in the world without caring for whether it connects to, to, to brains uh, uh, or not. But I'm personally particularly interested in, 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 uh, in the notion that uh, we want to build systems that are actually based on biologically plausible mechanisms. So roughly speaking, right now, I think that that has to do with, at the very least, uh, uh, a neural network type of uh, uh, architecture. Uh, a neural network is not quite a replica of, of, of the brain. We can debate about exactly what we mean by biologically plausible. That, that's, that's an ill-defined concept. And, and I don't want to get into too many details now. We can, we can dif discuss what it means. But, but let, let's say for now, at least, it has to be something like a neural network. Uh, these, these models should be able to account for behavior. That is, it should be able to, they should be able to describe uh, our visual illusions, our visual percepts, uh, how we recognize uh, Bill Clinton, how we uh, recognize uh, chairs, how we uh, uh, get confused with circles uh, uh, um, that, that appear to be of different size. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I also think that they should account for neuronal responses. That is, ultimately, we want to be able to explain how neurons respond to, to, to different stimuli as well. And again, this, this is not universal. This is my own wish list, my own desiderata. Uh, there are lots of people out there who, who may not care about, uh, uh, about human behavior or, or, or about neuronal responses. I, 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 I do. Uh, I think it's very important that these models should generalize. And I'll come back to this idea of generalization uh, uh, later on. Uh, I don't want to just build a model that works on the training set or a model that can only work with chairs or of, of a certain type. Uh, I, I want models that are general that can do everything that we do with our visual system. And importantly for me as, as a scientist, it should be falsifiable. Uh, if a theory is not falsifiable, uh, it's not a scientific theory. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful uh, uh, English literature. Uh, Jane Austen is not falsifiable. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, it's just Jane Austen, right? Uh, but but if, we, if we want to build scientific theories, they need to be falsifiable. We need to be able to do experiments that will falsify theories. Uh, interestingly, uh, if, if you ever read Karl Popper, you cannot prove theories to be right. Uh, you can only falsify them. Okay. So this is this is I think crucial for for any any scientific account of of, of, of visual process. And a lot of people think that it's uh, uh, perhaps embarrassing to falsify theories and to prove your models wrong. Uh, I personally think that's exciting. I think that's good. It's good if we have a model and we can prove that it's wrong. Uh, I think that's scientific progress. That's that's good. That means we have to build a better uh, better model. A lot of people are afraid and say, "Oh, you ask them about falsifiability. How would you falsify your ideas?" And a lot of people feel intimidated by that. And 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 you'll hear lots of talks of people who never think about how they can falsify their their their, their ideas. Uh, I think most of the models that we have right now are wrong. Um, a famous person once said, uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, so I, I fully embrace that notion. I think we should build models. I think those are essential for understanding. We should build models that are falsifiable. We should falsify them. That's, that's part of our work. That's part of our job. Uh, and then create better ones. Uh, in a way, it's a recipe for scientists to have a, to have a job for, for a very long time. right? So you build something, then you prove it's wrong, and then you build another one, and, and, and so on. 
Uh, okay, so just a quick comment about uh, computational models. Um, some of you may be familiar with this very famous piece of art by René Magritte. Uh, uh, for those of you who speak French, my French is very bad, I apologize. Uh, it's even worse than my English. Uh, so this is, this, is, uh, this is not a pipe. This is a representation of a pipe. Um, and th there was a lot of discussion in the art communities about what, what exactly this means. The idea is that you cannot, you cannot smoke with that, right? That, that, that's a picture, right? Uh, so similarly, uh, the kind of computational models that, that we build here are not a brain. This is not a brain. This sort of is the French word for, for brains. This is a representation. This is an abstraction. This, this is ignoring uh, a huge amount of stuff that's happening in the brain. Uh, in particular, every single one, even the, the state of the art, our best models, uh, the, the algorithms that allow my, my, uh, my phone here to detect my, my, my face uh, and recognize my face, uh, all the algorithms that you will see that can do uh, instant segmentation or, or your favorite algorithms uh, are, far, are really very, very far from, from, from neuroscience. Uh, they're very far from the mesoscopic connectivity of the visual cortex by Feldman and Manesson, and they're even farther away from the real connectome described here. We can debate about what's the right level of abstraction for, for a computational model, but I think it's important to have models that are abstract. Uh, that is, we're not trying to replicate every single atom uh, in, the, in the primate uh, brain. Uh, we, we, we want to have models that fulfill that desiderata that I was uh, alluding to uh, uh, earlier. Uh, that doesn't mean that my models need to have ATP. ATP is the currency in biology for, for, for energy conversion. Uh, that doesn't mean that my model needs to have every single one of the different, 100 different types of interneurons in the brain. Okay? So there, there, there will be some abstractions, there will be some mathematical rendering of what we mean by, by building computational models. And, and people disagree, and, and I think this is a fruitful discussion on, on, on what, 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 what's correct, uh, what, 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 what we can abstract away and what we should never abstract away. What, what are the basic ingredients that we cannot get rid of, and, and what are those that are, that are necessary? Okay. Okay. So um, one of the first models of uh, visual processing came from uh, Fukushima uh, in the 1980s, and, and if you look at the picture from from Fukushima uh, and you squint a little bit, you can sort of see the the basic genesis of the current deep convolutional networks that are so fashionable today and have been so successful uh, in the last decade uh, in, in 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 a lot of visual uh, uh, different types of tasks. This was directly inspired by the recordings of uh, Hubel and, and Wiesel. Uh, what I didn't tell you about the Hubel and Wiesel discovery is that they, they discovered basically two types of cells in, in, in B1. One they called simple cells, the other one complex cells. The simple cells detect these orientations, but they are very picky to this particular scale and position of the stimulus within the receptive field, whereas the complex cells had a higher degree of invariance. They were tolerant to the particular phase uh, uh, and position of the, of the stimulus within the receptive field. So basically, Fukushima here had these S layers and C layers, these simple layers and complex layers that were basically doing this uh, concatenation of filtering operations to get more selectivity and, and then complex uh, uh, operation, uh, 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 units to actually build uh, environments. If we fast forward a couple of decades, uh, Tommy Poggio, uh, uh, together with Max Pearson Hoover, uh, came up with uh, the so-called HMAX model, uh, which was, uh, uh, again, based on these ideas of Hubel and Wiesel, a hierarchical model uh, that also uh, was compared with, uh, with behavioral metrics and, and with neurophysiological metrics. And, and this, this, this gave rise to basically uh, everything we know of today in terms of uh, basic models of computer vision. So these, these basic biologically inspired computational models were the pioneers of, 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 the, of the whole generations of, of, of deep uh, uh, neural, uh, neural networks. Um, Thomas Sir uh, uh, is, 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 a, uh, is a great scientist who, who worked with, with Tommy Poggio as well, and he made major contributions to this type of models, and he will tell you more about that in, uh, in, in, in a couple of days. So fast forward uh, uh, a few decades, uh, that there were a couple of uh, things that changed dramatically in the last decade. One is that uh, we now have uh, uh, an, an incredible amount of data to be able to train computational models. Th that, that, those were not available uh, in, the, in the days of Fukushima uh, or even in the days of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Max Fries and Hoover and, 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 and Tommy Poggio's uh, model. So now, now we can train models with many, many more images. We have access to, to uh, exciting and tremendous computational resources that were not available there. And then people started using algorithms, especially an algorithm that many of you are probably very familiar with, stochastic, stochastic gradient descent or backpropagation, where one can build this type of hierarchical models and start to do fine tuning of each of the weights uh, in, that, uh, in, in, in those networks. By tuning the weights and by uh, uh, the additional computational resources and the enormous amount of data, uh, performance uh, basically uh, 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 exploded in terms of uh, th there was a major uh, improvement in the ability to do uh, computer vision tasks and, uh, and, and do pattern recognition. So this is a, a, a rather outdated slide by, by now. This is a, a, a competition uh, that's based on, uh, I give you a bunch of images and I want to know what the labels are. So those images include uh, chairs and faces and, and, and dogs and cats and so on. One of the famous data sets is called ImageNet. Again, many of you are very, very familiar with this. And the idea is how many of those images you can label uh, correctly. Uh, so in 2010, uh, the error rate was uh, about 28%. This is outdated by now. This is uh, 2016. Um, uh, it went down to about uh, 3%. Some people have claimed that, at least for this particular data set, it's, it's, it's almost solved in a way. So it's, a, it, 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 it's at the level of human performance in terms of how well people can discriminate images. I will argue that we're still very far, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But, but in terms of this particular image, uh, image net data set, which has about a million images, uh, there has been an, an, an incredible progression of performance. You can imagine this. this uh, uh, this is uh, way, way better now than, than, than in 2016, but, but we have amazing algorithms by a combination of these three different ingredients uh, on top of the basic ideas of people like Fukushima and, and, and Tony Pocho. Yes? Just, just curious, this is a little bit talking about back-propagation, that's the big thing. The big thing here Back propagation? Well, yeah, so, so the, the paper so so the paper on back propagation uh, I think it goes back to nineteen ninety. You you may what's that? Sorry, I, I cannot hear you very well. Eighty five. Eighty eight. Okay. All right. Yeah, so so no, no I, I agree. So so the, the basic idea of back propagation uh, uh, it's not from the 2010s. You're absolutely right. So if, if I said that, I, I, I said it wrong. So yeah. So, so backpropagation has been around uh, much, much earlier than than, than 2010. Um, uh, people, uh, interestingly, as soon as backpropagation came up, uh, I think then the, the next month or the next week, uh, there was an article by Francis Crick in, in Nature saying backpropagation is not biologically plausible, and and people have been fighting about uh, the biological possibility of learning in a backpropagation way uh, uh, ever since. But you're absolutely right. So backpropagation, uh, the, the the timing is is not 2010. Uh, it it goes back uh, uh, much earlier. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, sometimes uh, it's, it's about uh, combining all of the right ingredients at the right time with all the right uh, tools. And I think that that's the, the major transformation. By the way, just to give credit, uh, in 2012, uh, Alex Krusevsky and, and, and Jeff Hinton were the people who came up with this. Alex Ned, this is, this is uh, known in the AI community as a major uh, paradigmatic shift uh, in, in terms of uh, performance. You can see a pretty large uh, drop. For those of you who submit papers to computer vision conferences, sometimes people fight about improving things by 0.5%, and they, they get very excited. They publish a paper when uh, the performance of one algorithm is 0.2% better than the other one, or 1% better. Going from 25 to, to 16, that, that, that's a big deal. Okay, so that, that, that's one thing. But, but, but yes, you're, you're right. It, uh, back backpropagation was, was not invented in, in, in the 2010s. It was uh, way, way earlier. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so uh, th that's actually, uh, uh, you predicted that perfectly. That's the end of the, the first part. And uh, we'll, we'll take a 10-minute break and then uh, come back for the next part.